Welcome to Behold Israel Young Adults Discipleship, The Word, The World, and You, where we're gathering together for a roundtable discussion with a couple of friends. Um, I just want to remind you all, for you young adults out there, that you can join us every week on Tuesdays uh, for our Yod, Young Adults Discipleship, Zoom call. And that's going to be, it starts at 8 a.m. Pacific time, so I guess you'll have to just work out what, uh, what time that is in your part of the world. But we want to invite you to come along and join us because that's a time when we can have a, an interactive discussion. Uh, we have some time in the Word, but also a time to, for ministry and other things where it's much more interactive, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so that's where I want to just make sure you have that invitation. At the same time, we're so grateful that you're here with us today. We're going to have a discussion around this question, is God good? And you know, that is such a question for so many when they think about the idea of a God or is he even is there even a God? And if there is, could he be good? Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world then? And so that's the question we're going to look at tonight and or well, tonight for me here in the UK. And I'm going to in, uh, invite Jason now who's in Phoenix, Arizona and Nick who's in Vancouver, Canada to come on in and join me. And we're going to have a discussion around this topic. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hi, everyone. Well, before we get started, let me go ahead and, and start us off with the most important thing we can do. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. And may it be fruitful, may it be a good time for everybody involved who hopefully the Lord will really minister and speak to hearts uh, today as we look at his word. So, Father, we do thank you again for this time to, uh, to gather together and to just look to you, God, to hear what you're speaking to us. And Lord, that's our desire. That's what we know we need. We need to hear from the God who made us, who created us, and Lord, who is sustainer of the universe. And so, Lord, we just pray now for this time. May you use it for your purposes and your glory for the young adults all around the world, Lord, to hear your heart and to understand how much you love them. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, you know, Nick, as we as we talk about this topic, this whole idea of is God good? You know, like I said, the question that arises in so many people's minds when they think about a good God or there even po the possibility of there being a good God is this very thought. Then why on earth <laughs> is there evil if, if God is good? Yeah. Yeah. It's a question, a long term question. Uh, everyone's got it on their minds. Um, but first, let's define what evil is. And evil is a corruption of something that is good. So the fact that there, evil doesn't exist on its own. It needs good to be there. As It's, it's not a counter to it. It's actually a, a deficiency or a lack of something that should be good. So, for instance, if you look, what is a shadow without a, the sunshine? You wouldn't have a shadow without the sunshine, or you wouldn't have rust on a car without the car being there, or you know, a cut on your finger without the finger being there. Um, so it's it's a deficiency or a corruption of something that's good. So, but, so when you say that, Nick, so like you say the fact that it's a corruption of something good, like because it does tell us, doesn't it? In the beginning, God created everything and said it is good. Yeah, and yet. What happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, God did not create evil and suffering, as you saw, in, you just said, Genesis 1, 31, God saw all that he had made and it was good. So, Jason, um, what is it that caused this evil to come? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because no, no one in the world denies the reality that there is good and bad. There is right and wrong. There is an inherent, <laughs> some may not see it this way, but there's an inherent moral compass. Uh, and the author of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that it's the acknowledgement of God, his existence is, eternity is inscribed on our heart. It, it is ingrained within us when we enter this world. And what's interesting is that Let's not forget whether whether you're a believer in Jesus or you're not. Maybe maybe you're here today and you're wondering. Well, let's let's understand that all of us are coming to this world the same way with the same spiritual deficiencies, with the same pit in our hearts. Every single one of us entered this world in unbelief. Every one of us. And so what's interesting is we have two different perspectives though. One that says 
Well, there's no absolute truth. So you, what's truth to you may not be truth to me. But what's interesting is as soon as the tables are turned and harm comes to the person who says there's no absolute truth, they're then put into a corner and they're, it's, they have to take it at face value as, uh, well, maybe there is something uh, because clearly maybe there's something that's challenging uh, my worldview, my viewpoint. And so what that is, is the reality is there's a constant battle of good and evil. And so how evil came into the world? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. The Bible gives us the full account early on in Genesis. And we have to recognize that part of being created in God's image is being created with the ability to make decisions. And so according to Genesis 1 in the creation account, verse 26 and tw verses 26 and 27 say this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea. And it goes on in verse 27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And then it goes on in chapter two, as you get over to verse 17, we see that early on it's indicated that the creation had the ability to make decisions. Verse 16 and 17 says, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So what we see is God is not the instigator. Because at this point, everything was still good in the garden. Everything was still good. So God's not the instigator of evil. But what we find out through the fall of man, the account in Genesis 3 Evil entered the world because of man's decision to rebel against God, which came from the spirit, from the devil's deception. There's, I mean, there's a lot of factors in play, but ultimately it entered the world because Satan con confused the woman about God's goodness. What we're talking so basically, about. Today. So Jason, what you're saying then really evil, it's not a, it's not a thing. But what it is, is it's actually a departure from the way things are supposed to be in God's goodness. So it's really, it's nonconformity. And I think it's interesting because as we're talking about evil and we're talking about this concept, you know, sometimes people would say, oh, I can't believe in a God or, or especially I can't believe in a good God or a loving God if there's evil in the world. And he allows there to be evil in the world. And yet the very point of declaring that there is such a thing as evil in the world is actually making the statement that there clearly then must be a moral law giver mm -hmm. to decide that something is right or something's wrong. Because what is evil if 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 there's no moral, you know, objective moral laws? Because you know, somebody might, I mean, there's so much evil going on in our worlds. For example, you know, somebody's gets uh, kidnapped or, or murdered or whatever might take place, and you might go, well, you know, in that person's thinking that there's nothing wrong with that. And and if there was no moral laws or anything, you know, objective in that way, you could just say, well, I don't like it, but you couldn't say it's wrong or you couldn't say it's evil, right? Could Because there would be right. no right and wrong. So yeah, God gave us free will. And that's really where sin entered is through that free will. He gave us the ability to make a decision. And it's not that he created evil, but he gave us, he, he had the potential for evil but we made it an actuality. So it's uh, God gave us the fact of freedom and we make the act of freedom. And so uh, at the end of the day, free will is, a, is an unforced decision between two or more choices, alternatives. And as we see at the fall, the first fall of man, mm -hmm. sin entered the world because of that um, moral decision uh, to not obey an absolute objective moral standard, which is God. And then we see in our society, we have subjective standards or it's relative. They'll say, you know, morals are relative. And we see what happens through everyone's got a decision. Everyone's got a choice. Everyone has a, uh, a standard or a uh, which is subjective. And we'll see societies that will say things are wrong, but but under what authority they'll, they'll it's their own collective uh view without god and as we saw in world war ii 
the Nazis thought they were doing good in their society. Everything was good for them that, you know, exterminating people. Uh, but yet other societies may have looked at that and said, no, that was wrong. But what if the world, as we're seeing heading towards, everyone starts saying, no, that's that's fine. Um, when yeah. you remove God from the picture, you remove that absolute gold standard. He's unchanging, unwavering, and he's given us the proper way to live. Yeah, you so, create a license for a departure from the create, because all of this comes down to it's a departure from God's created order. And that's what all yeah. of this is. And it never works. It never lasts. It always leads to more problems. And I mean, we can see that from the account of their banishment from the garden and what it led to outside of the garden. What's yeah. it led to so quickly? Yeah. So, objective. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead, Nick. Yeah. Objective moral values are not hard to know, you know, because uh, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, that we all have a conscience. So the, the, the objective moral values are not hard to know, but for many, they're hard to accept. And mm -hmm. we want to do our own thing. We want to be our own gods in life. And mm -hmm. so there's there's a difference between our knowing the purpose for evil in this world and for God having a reason for it. And we don't have God's mind. Um, you know, we don't see things clearly right now. We look at First Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 12, and it says, for now we see things imperfectly, almost like a um, it's almost like a mirror dimly, it says. But one day we'll see it clearly. So, so maybe the question then that somebody might ask at this point is, well, then why even give us a free will? If, if you know we're going to, you know, choose the wrong way, why even give us a free will? And yet we'd have to answer, well, a free will is a good thing, right? Because yeah. what if we didn't have a free will? What would, what would life be like? What would, what would we be like if there was no free will? Wouldn't be a loving God. Well, there's no love if there's no choice, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, I can make a robot and program them to, to love me. But is that real love? I'm just following a program that that person would have no choice. OK, so let's let's take it to another place. Then there's a reason yeah. there's a reason that God told Saul. That God, the message to Saul was obedience is better than sacrifice. There's a mm -hmm. reason it's because God's not looking for your acts. God's looking for your heart. Mm -hmm. He wants your heart. And just as you can't force someone into a marriage relationship, just as much as a forced relationship has no love behind it. So it's, it's the same concept with, with God. What God's not insecure. God's not irrational. God doesn't create things so that he can force them to know him so that he can feel good about himself. That's how humans work. But that's not how God works. That's not who he is. Hmm. Right. It's got to be yeah. a choice, doesn't it? It's got to be a choice for it to be love. And, you know, here's another kind of question, especially as a pastor I, I get, is this idea <clears throat> that, okay, well, God's allowing evil. Why, why, why doesn't he just put an end to it then? I mean, he's, if he's mm -hmm. really all powerful, couldn't he just put an end to evil here and now? And I just want to, you know, put, give an answer for that as I, as I hear that quite often. And it's just this idea that, oh, no, no, don't you worry. He will. <laughs> we can yeah. read in Revelation chapter 21, it will come to an end. Evil will come to an end. There will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more tears. It is coming. But here's the thing that we need to realize in this world where we're at right this minute. If God, because like, if somebody says, why doesn't God just put an end to evil? He's got the power to. Why doesn't he just do that now? Well, if God was to do that, that means he would have to put an end to anything and everything that causes suffering, any evil that causes suffering. OK, so we got to work that, you know, take that to its to its end. That means he's got to stop anybody and anything that causes suffering. So whether that's somebody who steals or somebody who acts selfishly or lies or or actually, you know, is a bad driver or a bad cook or whatever you are. Yeah, let's say, face it, it's you. you know, you'd have to yeah. stop everybody. So wait, <laughs> how many people is that going to be then, right? How many does yeah. that lead us to? And so really what that's saying is God would have to stop me. He'd have yeah. to stop you. He'd have to stop all of us if he was to have to stop evil. But the point is, by not stopping evil right this minute, 
It's his mercy. He's giving people a chance that yes, one day it will be done. But in this time, he's giving people a chance to make the choice that they can actually choose not to go that direction. And he's trying to, you know, show them that he is the loving God. But again, you know, what do you guys think of that? I think, yeah, exactly, Jeff. It brings us up to the next point of why bad things happen in our lives. And this is, uh, what is the purpose of life? Is it to be happy, content, acquire things? No, we know as believers, the purpose of life is to know God and to make him known. And not at, at a lot of times, we need to we need suffering in our lives to bring us to that reality that we need God. When things are great, I, I'll be the first to admit, when things were great in my life in the past and I got all my, the way, everything I wanted, I was spoiled. You make spoiled children, giving them everything they want. And you don't need God at those times. But, you know, C.S. Lewis, he said a great quote. He said, sometimes you only look up when you're on your back. <laughs> and uh, pain keeps us from self-destruction. You look mm. at the lives of, of uh, there's people with conditions and some like lepers, for instance. Uh, they lose their feeling in their extremities, their toes, fingers and stuff. And they actually bump into things and burn themselves on stoves and don't feel the pain. So it's actually destroying them. Mm. Whereas, you know, people have normal uh, nerve endings. They touch, oh, it burned. That's bad for me. I'm going to stop that. And so, right. you know, Jesus told, told us that you will have suffering in this world. He didn't say you might. He said you will. And this is John 16, 33. But he also says, Paul says in Romans 5, uh, verses 3 to 8, that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. So it's to make us more and more like Christ. And you need that um, resistance. You don't develop uh, courage without danger or perseverance without resistance. Jason, you're a CrossFit guy. Why do you know? <laughs> the world is actually one big gym uh, because, you know, spiritually speaking, we need to be spiritually challenged with hardships and pain and suffering in order to grow our character. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, when you go to CrossFit, do you well, not? It's the, <laughs> yeah, it has its, uh, it, I mean, it hurts, yeah. um, <laughs> but it yields something good long-term, but it's the same right. reason. It's the same reason I don't try to, my wife has to remind me not to just do everything for my kids, not just, uh, you know, mm -hmm. they make a mess. I don't just pick up after them. I, it's my temptation to pick up every single time. Cause I like having a nice, clean house. <laughs> it's the temptation, but, uh, there's, and there's several other areas of their lives, but it's all that to say it's, uh, it's teaching them something. It's, it's, it's growing them for what's coming. I mean, they're just little kids right now, but eventually they're going to have to face life and they're going to have to have personal responsibility. And so, yeah. Yeah. So what you're, what you guys are talking about then really is, is this, it's this other question, isn't it, that so often people will ask is around this topic of, yeah, if, if God is good, you know, if you're telling me he's good, then why are bad things happening in my life? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that that reminds me of a, of, well, a Bible story. Go figure um, <laughs> of a time in um, Jacob. You remember good old Jacob who became yep. Israel. But. Prior to that, you know, we remember that he was there or actually after that, but after he became Israel, but he, his son, you know, Joseph had gone down to Egypt, but he didn't know that. He thought he was gone. He thought he was dead. And and then, you know, Benjamin ends up going down and they, you know, all these things are, are going in a way that just seem terrible. They seem absolutely awful from Jacob's perspective. And, and when his sons come back to report to their dad, this is what's happened. This is what's going on. You remember that line he 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 comes out with. He says, "All these things are against me," yeah. right? And, and and from his perspective, that's what he could see, and so that's what made sense to him. Like circumstances were pointing to the fact that God wasn't being very good, and things looked terrible, and all things were against him. When you and I both know, because we know the whole story, and we saw what was actually going on behind the scenes, so to speak, where Joseph was actually down in Egypt 
being prepared to save their lives and yeah. they were going to be reunited. And God had an amazing plan. He was working all things actually together for good. good. So all things were not against him. All things were actually working together for good. And for so God love didn't have a plan. And I'm just one more thought on this is I'm, I'm so often, you know, when from our perspective, again, I keep saying that because what happens is, and you maybe heard this illustration before, when God's, you know, orchestrating things and working things together, people have used the illustration of it being like a tapestry. Like he, he's, he's creating a tapestry. But from our vantage point, as we look up, you know, to God, what we see is kind of the underside of this tapestry where it just looks a mess. You just see all these, you know, um, threads that are, you're, you know, but you can't really tell what's going on. This looks like an absolute mess. But from God's perspective, it's a beautiful tapestry and he's weaving something together in our lives. It's actually magnificent, but we just can't see it sometimes. And so it's a real encouragement to us to not lean on our own understanding, but in right. all our ways, just to acknowledge him, to realize he is working things together for good. And that's why sometimes, even though it seems bad, yet he works it in a way that we see the good come out of it. For those that love him. It's not a guarantee for those who don't love him. Exactly. And, and one Very of the important. greatest examples of something that we look at, we see obviously Jacob and Joseph's life and throughout Psalms, you'll see the things that God's doing for good, even though we don't see the good at the time. But God can do anything. And you might say, well, not in my circumstances. The damage is too extreme or the pain and suffering is too much. I, I, God can't work good out of this. The great, you know, God took the very worst thing that ever happened in the universe, the very worst thing, and that is the death of God on the cross. And he turned it for not just a neutral thing, but for our salvation and adoption into his family, that anyone who has faith and trust in him has everlasting life. So he turned the death of God on the cross, the worst thing that could ever happen in history, to the greatest thing that ever happened in this universe. And that is our, our ability to have salvation. Um, so God can turn any situation around for good. Mm. And mm. I think, I think with that, with acknowledging the truth of what we talked about earlier, that yes, we've established that God is good and that evil is a departure from him really. And yeah responsible for the departure we're responsible for the departure and what i think is so interesting is when you look at the life of job um job i can't imagine with yeah. the losses he faced in such a short period of time i mean imagine all of that and not not making sense of what was going on. He didn't fully understand it at first. He didn't he didn't understand. And I would we? Uh, but what we see when we look at the, the story of Job, when we look at his life, we see that a lot a lot of the bad things that happen in this life, a lot of the the evil things taking place, are often the result. And it was in Job's life the result of a spiritual battle behind the scenes manifesting itself in Job's life. And that is what's happening because the Lord one day is going to restore all things. Nothing is going to hinder him from doing that. He's got a plan. He's as pa he's perfectly patient. But in the meantime, as Jesus said, building off of what you, what you mentioned earlier, Nick, as Jesus said about there will be tribulation in this life. Well, Every moment there is a spiritual battle that is manifesting itself on this earth uh, in different ways. And it happened to hit straight home in the life of Job. And so we have to recognize that too, that when bad things happen, first of all, it's not God with a magnifying glass over an anthill. You know, it's not something like that. That's not God's character. Sometimes bad things happen because of our own personal decisions until we decide to own that and change the course, we shouldn't expect anything to change. But also let's not forget that there's a spiritual battle at play here and there will be for the rest of our lives until we're taken home. That's the state of this world and it's going to get worse. Mm. But mm. what's amazing is though it doesn't, though it's going to get worse is that God's desire to dwell with us, God's love for his creation, God's 
desire for you and me is far greater than the pits of the sin of the world. Where sin is great, his grace is greater. And so his desire for us far outweighs. And that's, I believe, why he's so patient, why he can withstand what's going on in the world. Uh, because he loves rebellion and departure from him and his truth yeah. is because he longs to see people restored to him. And one day it's going to happen eternally. Yeah. Second Peter three, nine, that's the one where it says the Lord isn't slow by our standards. He's waiting because we're, he loves us so much that he wants all to come to him. He's given time. So, but our suffering in the end, it'll pale in comparison to what God has in store for us. And this is something to keep in mind. All of us is that we have to look at the long-term perspective here. You know, Paul says in second Corinthians four, he says, for this light momentary affliction, this guy suffered. Have you seen the sufferings he took? He had Seriously. literally um, beatings, stonings, shipwrecks, imprisonments. He was flogged five times. No, yeah, five times, three times. He was beat with rods to a pulp. And he says, well, these are light and momentary afflictions. So the, I'll give you an example, how we should look at this in, in a perspective. You know, Jeff, Jason, let's say you had the worst day of your life, like, the worst thing that can happen one day you start your year and it's like you lost a loved one your house burned down and you had no insurance you had a root canal with no anesthetic you broke your leg <laughs> you lost your job right, stop, okay, stop, this stop. Is a terrible the worst day you could imagine but then let's say the next day you have the greatest day you ever had like your neighbor gives you wins the lottery gives you 10 million dollars you get your dream job you you're as close to god as you've ever been you um have you know thousands and thousands of friends you're in fellowship you have all the great things and do that for every single day of that rest of that year if i ask you jeff jason how was your year wow it was a great year yeah but didn't it start like really hard didn't you have a horrible day yeah, it was hard. It was difficult that day. But you know what? It's kind of fading. Well, continue doing that for millions and millions of years of amazing, joyful days you couldn't even express how joyful it is. And I love my, one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 2, nine. But it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And eventually the stuff that we go through in this life will be like a vapor. Um, and I'm not minimizing what people go through and the, the hardships and things. It is real. It's heartbroken. But we have, you know, we can have friends that come alongside and, and um, you know, empathize with us. And that's great. But Jesus, he took it on. When, when we suffer, he suffers. When he's in our heart, he feels it and he's with us, carrying us. So the times when we struggle and, and have things in our life that are difficult, run to him. And that, that's the, the best suggestion I can make. And at yeah. the end of the day, there's two types of people in this world. There's going to be those at the end who will say to God, thy will be done. And we want God's will to be done. And then there's those who God's going to say to them, thy will be done. Your whatever will you want, and it comes to that free will and that free choice. Um, so yeah, as we as we wrap it up, you know, I mean, as I've heard from you guys, and as we've talked about this, what we've realized here is the fact that there is a good God, and and yet the choices what, from from what we've heard and what we've talked about, you know, we as mankind have made a choice. There's choices. We have a responsibility. And God has allowed us that. And that actually was one of the good things he did. He gave us a free will. Why? As you guys said, because it had to be a love relationship. It has to be a choice. And if it's not a choice, then there is no love. And, and that's what I've heard and that's what I've seen. And so what we realize is, and here, let's, let's finish with this thought because you know what? If anybody, if any of you right now are hearing these words and you're still kind of contemplating and wondering, Okay, well, you kind of you've made an argument about evil, and it's our you know it's our decision. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. You know all that, but but you're still kind of wondering. Yeah, but I just don't know if I can trust him. I don't know if he's good. Well, let me just tell you, he answered that question once and for all for you, for me, and for all eternity when Jesus Christ came to this world, lived a perfect, 
sinless life and then went to the cross of Calvary as Nick alluded to earlier. And it tells us in Romans 5, 8 that he, you know, the fact that while we were yet sinners, while we were his enemy, while we were his adversaries, while we didn't care about him, he died in our place. The greatest demonstration of love there ever could be. And so when you and I realize how much he loves us because he was willing to demonstrate it, you might ask, how much does he love you? You know what? You stretch out your arms wide and you go, he loves you that much. He was willing to die in your place and in my place. And that is the greatest demonstration of love that this world has ever known. And so you can know that you know that you know that the God who made you, the God that maybe you're you're separated from right now because of your sin, has paid the price for your sin. He who knew no sin became sin for you so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so when you know that he's done that for you, that's where we come back to this point of it's a love relationship. Now you have a choice. You can accept that or you can reject it. But Jesus is offering this to you and to me and to all of us that we can come to a saving knowledge of him by putting our faith and trust. We're saved by grace, through faith, not works. Because yes, all the wages of our sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And so you can confess your sins and he is faithful and just to forgive you of all those sins. And you can you know, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is God and he has been raised from the dead. Therefore, you have the hope of eternity with him and you can know that your sins are forgiven. And, and that's really, as we conclude today, you know, what we realize is the fact that this whole idea, yeah, there is evil in the world and it's because we've turned from a good God. And yet that good and loving God has turned to us and said, I still love you. I love you so much. I'm going to die in your place so that we can be together for all eternity and things will be right in the end. Right? Yeah. Can I so, say one last thing? Uh, sure. Know, John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in, in me, you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but take heart or take courage. I have overcome the world. So he gives us peace for today and courage to face tomorrow and the future and an incredible promise of eternal life in heaven. Suffering and death don't have the last word. Jesus had the last word because he overcame them. And uh, we have everlasting life with him. So in full scope, can we answer the question? Our theme today is God good how would you guys answer that <laughs> well yeah. i think i, I think yeah, i just did <laughs> I, I, I expect a certain answer but in but in in full scope how can we answer that can we be sure that god is is god good i think so i think he's beyond good yeah the fact yeah, that we, god so loves this world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him doesn't have to perish but can have everlasting life god is good, good. Yeah. 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 Amen, right? Amen, and hey, yeah. so, you know, for you young adults out there as well, I just want to say, you know, um, you're going to be challenged in this area, like constantly. And one of the things I've found that when you're going through difficult times, you have an en enemy, you have an adversary who's going to be right there when things don't go well to challenge the goodness of God in your life. He's, he did it since the beginning. He did it with Eve. <laughs> you know, if God was really good, he wouldn't be withholding from you. He wouldn't be withholding the, the this fruit from you. Clearly, he must not be good. He's going to challenge the goodness of God in your life. And that's where you need to know that you know that you know. Uh, that's why actually my life verse is Nahum 1.7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. So I just want you to be encouraged and built up. And again, if you have questions, if there's things on your heart as a, as a young adult, we have an email address you can write to, yad, Y-A-D, at beholdisrael.org. We'd love to hear from you. We're here to answer those questions. We'd love to see you on Tuesdays on the uh, on the Zoom call so we can get to know you and we could have interaction. And if you have questions or, you know, you want to share your story, we'd love to we'd lo love to get to know you better. So Come on out. We'd love to see you there. And uh, I guess that's uh, that's goodbye from us this week, huh, guys?